think we can go ahead. Okay. Thanks everybody for joining our webinar. My name is Craig A. Smith and I am a senior lecturer at the Asia Institute here at the University of Melbourne. Um, so first off, I would like to acknowledge that we are coming to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And we would like to um, express our deep respect to their um, to, to, to the elders past, present, and emerging. And we would also like to extend this to any Indigenous peoples who might be in the room today. So, um, as I said, my background is, uh, well, I'm, I'm a, lecturer, a senior lecturer in translation studies, but I've also been involved in Taiwan studies for about 20 years now. So this is a, a topic that's um, quite important to me. And today, I'm lucky to be joined by two wonderful scholars who also have a lot of experience in Taiwan studies. We have uh, from Deakin University, Associate Professor Lan In Zhang. He's Associate Professor of Cyber Risk and Policy, but also he's the founding president of the Australasian Taiwan Studies Association and has a wide um, variety of interests in Taiwan studies. Thanks for joining us, Lenin. Thank you, Craig. And we also have Professor Antonio Fenain. Uh, Professor Fenain has a, a wonderful uh, list of achievements in the study of modern Chinese history. But especially in the last few years, she has been writing more and more about Taiwan, especially related to gender and politics, which we're going to be talking about today. Thank you for joining us, Antonia. Thank you, Craig. Okay. Um, so before I turn to them for questions, very briefly, I'll just uh, say that this, this webinar comes out of our special edition for the Melbourne Asia Review. It's a special edition on Taiwan, which I edited along with our wonderful managing editor, Kathy Harper. We have, I believe, 10 articles uh, written by academics from Australia, from Taiwan, and from the People's Republic of China. And uh, we also have one interview and one book review. So we've got an interesting mix of articles on politics and society. If you haven't had a look at it yet, please do have a look. Um, now, Antonia and Lenin and I continue this conversation today, partly because we really realize there is a pressing need for Australians to have a better understanding of Taiwan. Taiwan is gradually becoming more and more important in Australian media. And of course, part of this is because of some fears of the prospect of war with China. Um, although I would say most academics disagree with what we see in the popular Western media about Taiwan, um, although we see it as a threat, People, um, we do not necessarily see a war happening in the near future. Um, but Lenin, um, I'm going to start with Lenin because Lenin has written a little bit about this for the Melbourne Asia Review. Um, now, Lenin, you make the argument that a kind of war has already broken out between Taiwan and China, but it's not really what we think of as war, and hopefully, it's not going to be as violent as many of us feared. Lennon, do you want to talk, tell us a little bit about this first? Yeah, thanks, Greg. And thanks for the question and introduction. And also I would like to thank Melbourne Asia Institute for the invitation and organize such a, a event for us to share our views and opinions and, and um, ideas about Taiwan. Well, likewise, before I start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owner of the land where uh, University of Melbourne operates and where I look on from and pay respect to the uh, uh, elders past, present and emerging. And I also like to express my thoughts. Um, my thoughts are with all those um, who have been affected by the recent earthquake in Huali and Taiwan. Um, back to Craig's question. I remember, I always, I always remember that uh, when I started my research on cybercrime, a lot of people told me that cybercrime is unlikely to happen. 
and even at the time stealing personal information won't or what we call virtual treasure won't be seen as a a crime because they didn't fit in the definition of property so um those things are like, at the time fit in the law such as intellectual property law but not definitely not in the criminal code but we see the change of technology and law now and we see cybercrime is real so back to when we were saying war is unlikely to happen it refers to the physical war with mass weapons damage and fatality uh, fatality however we see in recent years gray zone activities including disinformation and cyber attacks are now being seen part of war or cyber warfare if it is not leading to the real what we call the physical war or uh physical uh the, the cyber warfare so it's important for us to really start to reconsider what is war, especially in the digital age. It's technology making making it more possible to so-called Butan or children to win to win without fighting. So I'm not going to the uh, the detail of uh, my argument in my paper. If I'm interested, I believe you'll be able to to read it from the uh, the uh, the review. But what I'm not going to say, what 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 I want to emphasize is that. The new war in uh, in the digital age in our current situation might look very different to what we think as war before, but with a lot of shootings, guns, um, mass destruction, this sort of things. It can be through political or psychological warfare, including disinformation. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Lenin. Okay, if I can kind of clarify that very briefly, um, we're talking about cyber attacks here on Taiwan, right? But every day in Australia, we also read about cyber attacks in Australia, and some of these are also coming from China or from other places. Can we say that Australia is in a cyber war? I mean, how do we define what war is, or is everybody in cyber war? How are you, how are you seeing this as a cyber war? Great question, Greg. Um... I guess it depends on the purpose of China or to be more precise, CCP uh, in conducting the cyber attacks against uh, Taiwan, Australia or other countries. If it is within the aim to take over Australia, then of course I will see it as a war. But um, if it is merely the, uh, the cyber attack to get information, especially national security uh, thing, uh, uh, messages or, or um, intelligence from Australia, then it might not be. I totally understand uh, people's concern on whether we should define war like this, but I have to say Taiwan is a, in a very different situation. So when we are comparing Australia and Taiwan, we are we are comparing two different countries and two different a very different situation. Although there are claims for, from states such as Japan, US, saying that um, they will definitely do something if there's a, a war across the street, we are unsure what actions will be taken or what 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 kind of uh, uh, activities they will get involved. So um, personally, I'll be very careful extending my argument I made in the article to Australia-China relations, but at least China, or what we say CCP, to be more precise, doesn't have a goal to take over Australia, but they do of Taiwan. But since Australia, uh, Craig X about uh, Australia, I would like to ex uh, point out some of the uh, uh, points I I want to make um about uh Australia Taiwan Australia Taiwan China relations, Australian government has made it very clear that there is in, there is informal collaborations engagement between Taiwan and Australia, and quote from the uh DFAT website Australia has substantial relationship with China uh, with Taiwan including trade investment education tourism and people to people ties, we still see the reality that there hasn't been any visit by government minister in many years, either from Taiwan to Australia or to from Australia to Taiwan. So we can understand under CCP's uh, pressure, we understand why this is happening. Um, however, there should be more substantial collaboration among like-minded countries like Taiwan to Australia in building up regional safety and security. And I, Personally, I don't think Australian government should shy away from it just because of uh, China's pressure. And one of the ideas I actually have is uh, maybe Australian government 
may, we, maybe uh, although we don't need these laws, but maybe Australian government can consider laws like similar to the U.S. Taipei Act, the Taiwan Ally Allies International Protect and Enhance Enhancement uh, Initiative, and also the Taiwan Travel Act. It is also important that federal government to give a green light and allow one track dialogues and communications between the two governments. Okay, thanks a lot, Lennon. If I can get away with one more follow up question on that, though, the so you know, and I read I read your article and the the scale of the attacks is also very different. In Taiwan, right? We're talking about attacks on the, on a huge scale, and then the content, as you say, uh, China wants to take over Taiwan, and the content is related to that. Can you give us an example of the content that you mentioned? One of the things we, we usually see in Taiwan is um, uh, through disinformation that, that they try to create chaos within the within the country. So they try to to polarize people's opinions, their trust to the government, so that they will be able to say, "Well, Taiwan is unstable. We might we we, we should come in to support or to help." So that's that's uh, that's the scenario that we're, we're predicting that through. Uh, uh, creating conflict or through creating chaos within the country, then they they will give them a good excuse to come in. And this is definitely not going to happen to China's um, cyber attacks targeting Australia. Does that make right. sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks, Lennon. Um, we'll we'll come back to well a similar topic and try and tie these two together in uh, in a few minutes. But I want to turn to Antonia Penain for a few minutes and talk about gender in politics uh, in the article that she wrote for the Melbourne Asia Review. Um, so, Antonia, I really enjoy this article. Um, obviously, it's coming right at the end of Tsai Ing-wen's presidency, and you point out uh, both positive and negative things related to Tsai Ing-wen's involvement of women in politics in Taiwan. But what I really like about it as well is you show this history of powerful women who played an important role in shaping Taiwan's future. When I was living in Taiwan, when I was a student in Taiwan, Annette Liu was um, a formidable figure, Liu Xiaolian. Uh, she was the vice president from 2000 to 2008, um, and in many ways, uh, she was even even more powerful figure than Tsai Ing-wen in terms of what she did for history. So then, now we just had the election, of course, in January, and we've got just a few weeks until the new government comes in, and the new vice president is also a woman. Xiao Mei Qin, uh, who we usually in English we oddly enough go by her her Hokkien name, Xiao Bigin. Um, so um, even her name actually is a lot we can talk about there. Now she's she's still kind of relatively young. She's very popular. Uh, she's got an impressive diplomatic career behind her. So uh, what do you what can you say about these powerful women? Are they representative of something in Taiwan that is special or unique? Because to me, coming from Australia, it seems like a, a very different picture over there. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Craig, and thanks for the opportunity to contribute today. Uh, and let me echo uh, both of you in paying my respects to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation um, before I say any more. And of course, Indigenous issues in Australia and Taiwan are one of the things that are, uh, is tying the two countries uh, together. There are quite a lot of links uh, developing around uh, shared interests in the First Peoples at the moment. I, I should hasten to uh, say to our audience that I'm not uh, basically a, a Taiwan studies uh, person. I was lucky to be there in the six months leading up to the uh, election. And the fact that I was there in some ways epitomizes what's happening now in relations with China, including with uh, China and Australia, because 
in the normal course of things, I would have been going back to China for my first, you know, post pandemic um, trip. But China has become quite an uncomfortable place for foreigners and it throws into relief what democracy has brought to Taiwan, which is a relaxed, open society where perfect strangers are happy to pass the time of day with you. And um, it is just a, a very different place socially than, than, than China is at the time that I was last there in 2018. And I have to say there's sort of been a downward, um, a downward spiral in ease of being in China over the 10 years preceding uh, that last visit. Um, but Taiwan was certainly a lot less relaxed the first time I was there, which was in 1979, which is exactly the year that Anna Liu came to international prominent, prominence as one of the Kaohsiung Eight. And I won't go into that uh, event now, but of course, it sort of is a searing um, moment in the movement towards the democratization of Taiwan. So I'm interested to hear you talking, um, Craig, about her, uh, about her, uh, hear you comparing her to Tsai Ing-wen in this way. I don't really see them in as being in competition for being the most important um, person in recent political history. The crackdown on rights activists in 1979-1980 was uh, a particular uh, highly important moment in Taiwan's history. All those activists really earned their stripes, you know, most of them in um, prison and from the ashes came the, 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 the DPP and democracy and Anna uh, Liu's period as vice um, president. Uh, so that period, you know, I have to say that from point of view of social equality, women's and women's participation in politics and gender relations in society, it is extremely important, as I say, said in my article, all the research shows this, for women to occupy these significant and very visible positions in uh, society. Um, from point of view of uh, women and women's issues in a society, which I'm not quite sure whether your question was pointing to that or not, uh, I suppose you could calibrate the different impacts of Lu and Sai. Uh, Lu herself has been anxious to point out that her interest in rights is not just women's rights but human rights more broadly for her i'm um, quoting from you know a later interview the big question is how to deal with china and in many ways that's always been the big question in taiwan and from the point of view of that question i think it would be hard to beat the impact of Tsai Ing-wen internationally and locally standing up to Xi Jinping in 2019. It's a bit like Zelensky standing up to Putin. We don't, thank goodness, have a war. Um, but the optics are great. This small little woman coming from nowhere, talking, uh, telling, you know, the great ponderous Xi Jinping about the four musts for dealing with Taiwan. It's hard to go past that as, you know, effective and important politics. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, so you're, uh, you, you're obviously very happy with some of the work that Tsai Ing-wen has done in this area for the last eight years, right? Uh, but now as she's heading out, we have Xiao Mei Qin, coming in as another powerful woman 
Uh, I'd like to hear what you have to say about her, uh, especially in relation to China, because, you know, if you look at her background, her diplomatic career in America, she was born in Japan. She had a, her mother was a white American, so she actually was American. Uh, she had to give up her American citizenship uh, to serve in the, in the government in Taiwan. So what do you think about her? Is she going to have a big impact? Is, is it going to be positive? It's going to be controversial, right? Uh, well, you know, I'm just sort of a fan of um, Xiaomi. Of Xiao, um, she's sort of like, it's, it's hard not to compare her to Penny Wong in so, uh -huh. so many respects, you know, the mixed background, you know, the out of country um, origins, the sort of total cool of both of them, their intelligent and charismatic presence on the international stage. I think that's very true of both these women. And I think um, Xiaobi King, um, she did a terrific job in the uh, United States. She did that hard diplomatic work that we were talking about before we started, before we came on uh, line uh, now. And she's continuing to do that in the lead up to the uh the the chat the handover in um in may so just recently in uh, czech republic which of course has got china's nose right out of joint um i'd just like to talk briefly about uh mention briefly the, because it occurred to me when lenin was talking about australia taiwan relations Another significant women, woman in, Cha, in Taiwanese um, uh, politics in the government is uh, Wang Meihua, who is the Minister for Economic uh, Affairs. And I just noticed a piece of news recently that I think a year ago when she visited Paris, there was no, the finance minister wasn't going to meet with her at all, and he didn't. But I think a couple of weeks ago, when she is again in Paris, they are, uh, for the first time, ministerial level meetings uh, involving uh, France and Taiwan and looking to various sorts of collaboration. And first of all, Wang Meihua is worth uh, mentioning here because there are very few women um, in the cabinet. So when I was writing about the paradox of Tsai Ing Wen, um, it was because she came. She was there, very visible, very interesting example of democracy at work, uh, but it didn't follow that there were lots of other women in powerful positions in the government. Um, Lai Ting De coming in, in May has promised, we are waiting to see whether this promise will be borne out, has promised that 30% of the cabinet is going to be women so far. He really hasn't announced any except for the vice premier. Mm. So, uh, the <laughs> important, the important. Uh, watch the space. Yeah, just just watch this uh, space. So, but Keep anyway, an eye on this, that, one, Wang, this Wang Mei Hua uh, yeah. visit to Paris is just a reminder to us that things aren't standing still internationally, and I'm just sort of waiting for Australia maybe to move with this. Aha. <laughs> In this right. Okay. Okay. So you're hoping that uh, Australia is really going to improve ties with Taiwan. Well, you not just Australia. Globally, you're, you're hoping Taiwan is going to have improved ties with, with countries around the world. Okay. Okay. Um, now, before we move on, just very briefly um, on women in politics. Um, okay. Well, well, actually, I, I should point point out uh, just. For, for everybody listening, there are a lot of women in politics in Taiwan. You're specifically talking about those high level positions, including the cabinet. That's where we're not seeing uh, a lot of women in power, including under the Tsai Ing-wen government. Um, so the, the Taiwanese government or the Taiwanese political parties actually um, made sure there was a quota for women in the party and women in political positions. Uh, I don't know. Are those, are those quotas still going today? Do we still have the quotas? Or uh, I think the, the quotas 
the quotas go to so there's two people you vote for someone in a seat mm -hmm. and then you vote for, and then there are party lists so the party right. voter goes to the party list so there is an assured number and of course as the sociologists of politics will tell you you know there's a spillover effect in that the quota does give women the um experience and it makes the constituency familiar with seeing women in these positions so in the end they also end up being the candidates for seats so it's a very positive thing the quota system okay yeah yeah agreed okay oh no one what about what about in in china um obviously there's you know in the 20th century there's there's quite a few uh important powerful chinese women and today there are still many powerful women in in finance business which is is, is kind of interesting but uh what about the chinese political world are we seeing anything like what's happened in taiwan well how can you <laughs> i mean yeah. just such a just such a different ball game, and you know it's been very hard for the Communist Party, which is you know worried about this. Very hard for them to build the numbers. I think it's still only about a quarter of party members are, are women, and to be to get anywhere, you do need to be a party member. And then look at the Politburo. Look at the you know the top rank. You know, you're sort of. You know, you're looking, you're looking for the women, and they're uh, and they're not there at all. There's there's an article in China Quarterly at the moment about the outperforming women of the National People's Congress. So the authors of that article are identifying, you know, this sort of this potential in the country for uh, ac uh, action along a, on a range of fronts, I suppose, which is very difficult to take in uh, such a controlled system. Right, right, right. Well, we hope that we'll see more women in power in China. Um, I think, Craig, one thing we we'll, we'll probably yeah. want to mention here is that um, gender equality is definitely an important issue as other social inclusions and diversities are uh, also something we need to take into consider. And, I would just say Taiwan is um, being very up in the front in this aspect. Like we have Audrey Tang as the minister. And then I know we're going to touch on these issues, but uh, also the, the uh, Samson Major Law, which was the first in Asia to have this, um, um, I shouldn't use privilege, but the right to, to, to divorce same sex uh, to get married. Mm -hmm. And this all happening in Taiwan. That's right. Yeah. So uh, on to sexuality. Thank you for for bridging that. So um, Audrey Tang is an is, is an excellent example. Tang Feng. Uh, she what is she? Minister of Information. No, she has a special Minister name. Of, Minister uh, of Digital digital affairs. digital affairs. Minister of Digital Affairs. Um, so Antonia, do you want to comment on that, or or do you let Andrea well, have say? Yes, just briefly. That is. Yeah brought into the cabinet by Tsai Ing-wen. When I first saw uh, Audrey Tang, I just sort of, she was, she looked so unlike a minister. Mm. Um, then of course I went and read up her um, biography. And yes, kudos to, kudos to uh, Tsai Ing-wen for, um, being being willing to have uh, a socially inclusive uh, cabinet, that is, in not uh, pandering to anything that her rather conservative constituency uh, might think about transgender uh, people. But kudos to Audrey Tang too, because she's just so brilliant. Yep. I mean, it was hard, I guess, I mean, the great appeal of her was not that she was someone who added diversity to the cabinet, which we know Tsai Ing-wen actually doesn't care about. The great thing about Audrey Tang is that she can really do a great job. That's right. And I mean, Audrey Tang, we see her speaking regularly on uh, 
in English, in perfect English, on all sorts of panels around the world, uh, not just related to digital digital affairs, but usually related to digital digital affairs. So she's become a kind of digital ambassador for Taiwan to the world in a very, very positive way. Mm. Okay, great, fantastic. Lena, did you have anything more you wanted to say about LGBTQI issues or Audrey Tang? Well, not not much comment on Audrey Tang. Of course, she she earned she earned the position not because of she's a transgender, but her as her capacity in in this area. But one of the I'm just uh, uh, following what uh, Antonio was saying is at least um, the government is not making the decision based on that she is a transgender or whether she she or he might have other other uh, sexual orientation. But well, when we're talking about the same-sex marriage, we will still say, well, while we think Taiwan is far ahead um, among many countries in in uh, the same-sex marriage, there are still a lot of debate and uh, objections towards um, uh, uh, this idea. One of the interesting things, if um, I, I believe some of you might already know, is that the, the law is not called as a same-sex marriage law in Taiwan. It's called something very interesting. The Act of uh, for Implementation of uh, Judicial Yuan Interpretation on Number Seven Four Eight. So that's the law that has been used to for for same sex marriage, and we know it's it's, it's a very creative, innovative ideas from uh, Susan Chang, but it at some stage shows that the government still need to uh, to deal with um, the the more conservative part, not to offend them too much. And that's something okay, we, we yeah. still need to continue having the conversation with. Mm. I have to say that uh, Shelby King um, showed her showed the flag here because she really campaigned strongly for that. And one of the, I think it was on the horizon already when in 2016 when Tsai Ing-wen uh, first came in and then it was extremely difficult for um, the whole uh, LGBTQI um, uh, community, as they um, call it, for gay people in Taiwan, it was very, very difficult to see DPP government actually dragging its feet. You know, like it took took a long time. It took a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, definitely. Taiwan still does have a lot of conservative people on these kind of issues. But also, it really, what you know, I moved to Taiwan in 1997 and uh, coming from Canada, and I came, I came from a pretty conservative area of Canada, uh, I was blown away with how open things were for um, LGBTQI peoples, queer peoples in, in the capital. Once you get outside of the capital city, things were a little bit different, of course, but um, definitely from my perspective, things were, were quite amazing. So I was quite surprised to find out um, so many years later how uh, the voters across Taiwan were not very supportive of same-sex marriage. Mm. So we have a, quite a, a cultural divide between mm. uh, those in power and those around the island. Yeah, that is quite um, different across, across the world, I think. But I think it's very important yeah. to see how law can create an environment and can lead so that quite conservative people, you know, once the law is in place, they begin to think of this as part of Taiwan's virtues. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Taiwan on the world stage. Yeah. 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 Mm. Okay. Um, now we're, 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 you know, time's going by. We're already at, uh, it's already 3.35. So um, I'm going to move on to another question to try and bring these two topics of um, gender and cyber war together, your two, ex your two areas of expertise. Um, last year, I spent a lot of time in Taiwan, and I was surprised by the popularity of the Kuma Academy. And the Kuma Academy is, uh, is a private organization and it educates Taiwanese people and trains them to prepare for the possibility of war so that they have a better education, know a lot more about what's going on with the military. But a lot of this is also related to cyber war. 
Now, I was really surprised to find last year that a lot of my old classmates, especially the women, had signed up for these courses. And, uh, and they told me it's very, very popular with women. And it's been in the news quite a bit since then, the Kuma Academy. Um, so what are your thoughts on this? Lennon, do you want to start? Oh, I, I can't believe I, Antonio wants to start. Happy to uh, you start. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, here I would like to say we, we already see some gender inequality discrimination. Well, <laughs> Craig is um, formulating this question. So we, we, even I'm saying even very interesting to see Craig is um, surprised to learn about women are signing up for for the Kuma Academy and join the uh, the the program. No matter what Kuma Academy is about, I don't think we should be surprised. We wait uh, each any of the gender sign in and to be, want to be part of it. And we see a lot of female uh, soldiers and military people already serving in different uh, divisions in in the uh, the Ministry of uh, 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 national defense in Taiwan now. But also this question I would like to say has demonstrated uh, that people have a lot of misunderstanding on what Kuma Academy is doing. I, I think we might at some stage invite um, Puma Sheng to come in to talk about why he set up this this um, this organization. I just um, happened to be now taking up taking up over her position as the chair of uh, Double Thing, who is also uh, uh, set up by Puma in Taiwan. So I sort of have a collection with with them. Um, try uh, we we'll get a chance to know more about the uh, academy. So what I want to, what I want to clarify here is that uh, Kuma Academy is not set up to build up uh, what we call military. So it's not training uh, military uh, uh, civil military, uh, military uh, soldiers. It's never in their in their scope. When when Chao Xinsen was talking about founding Kuma Academy, that's already be something that has been cut out in in the discussion. So Puma uh, Kuma Academy is set up to build up defense capacity, including training to uh, civilians on various topics, including nursing, first aid, how to combat disinformation, media literacy, and the most important thing of all is what we used to, to learn when we were a kid is when the war happens, what you need to do. What can you do if you are not up at the front. So this is uh, very much what Kuma Academy is doing now. And we see a lot of parents are bringing their kids in on their uh, uh, holiday uh, affairs uh, in the parks to learn about different ideas. So um, yeah, I think um, the, the key thing here is that the successful of Kuma Academy, uh, as what Craig just mentioned, you need to probably queue up in order to register to be, to be a, a trainee or a member of it is that we saw most of the Taiwanese are now aware of Taiwan's situation and are willing to stand up or get ready for it. So it, it, I think it's a very, very positive sign about uh, of Taiwanese on current situation. We are not shying away from that. We know we, we don't want it to happen, but we have to get prepared, get prepared when, when in case it happens. Right, right, right. And of course, uh, the, the, the war in Ukraine uh, played a role in kind of bringing out that awareness and preparedness. And uh, still now, you when you when you're in 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 Taiwan, you often see the uh, the blue and yellow for supporting Ukraine. And uh, I was I was surprised uh, two years ago to find a really good Ukrainian restaurant. <laughs> So I, I grew up in a in in, in Canada and in, in actually um, an area with a lot of Ukrainians. So uh, it was wonderful to find good Ukrainian food in Taiwan, and that's just because of uh, Taiwan's support for Ukraine. Obviously, seeing it as uh, you know potential for what the situation Taiwan may one day be in. Yeah. Antonia, did you want to did you want to uh, say anything? Oh, I just wanted to comment, first of all, on uh, going to arriving in Taiwan middle of last year, the consciousness of air raid shelters everywhere and the thought that although uh, people on the streets sort of seem pretty, oh, sane, you know, they don't let, you know, the prospect of war 
uh, trouble them in their uh, daily lives. But, you know, there is this sort of um, constant presence now. And in uh, if you're in Hualien, like obviously before the earthquake or Tainan, um, jets scrambling all the time. So it's this, I, you know, the possibility of war is very um, present. But as for, and as for women in the armed forces, I think the numbers are quite small, especially in the Air Force. There's a lot of uh, articles out there about how the Air Force really needs people. It's ageing, you know, it's small. There are few women. And when they, when Tsai when decided last, announced last year that the period of conscription was going to be extended back from four months to a year, there was talk then about the possibility of following Israel, you know, and uh, recruiting uh, the women as well as the men. And that hasn't happened. Uh, but just because it hasn't happened doesn't mean that the women aren't thinking that they too are citizens of Taiwan. So, yeah, it, it sort of makes sense to me that uh, they would be uh, lining up for uh, the, the sort of training that Kumar Academy uh, would offer, including, uh, I read somewhere recently, you know, uh, how to save your furry animals. <laughs> that's that's a very important thing for Puma Academy. <laughs> yes, that's wonderful. That's so Taiwan, isn't it? Yeah. How to protect your cat? And, and I, can, I can tell you, Antonio, a lot of them are cat person, not dog person. I yes, absolutely. I know there are more cats and dogs than there are children under ten in Taiwan. <laughs> oh, that's got to be true these days. Yeah, yeah. Okay, look, I'm gonna ask one more question, um, but. Uh, while we're finalizing this last question, everybody in the audience, if you want to start putting your questions into the Q&A, there should be a button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please put your questions in there and we will answer them in the order in which they appear. Um, so my final question for both of you uh, is about Australia. So obviously, you both spent a lot of time in Taiwan, and you have some strong opinions about life there and uh, about social and political issues related to Taiwan. So if there was something that we could turn to Taiwan for to benefit our own society or politics here in Australia, what specific examples do you think we could look to? Sorry, that's a pretty big question but I think it relates to things that both of you have been discussing. Now, Antonio, would you like to start? Well, I, <laughs> I'm just going to um, uh, quote my husband here, who also spent six months in, uh, six or seven months in Taiwan last year, and who's just written an article following the earthquake, uh, um, public, and it's been published in... Uh, the ASPI, sorry, what is this? The, yes, the Strategic um, Policy Institute um, website. And it's talking about the way w in which Australia can learn uh, about crisis management from Taiwan. And he compares this earthquake with a previous one where there was a serious death toll and the whole learning process that Taiwan has under uh, undertaken since then and uh you know it was a very good illustration of a society you know absolutely that it's that it's not as wealthy as australia's whatever however much people compare them but it was able got its act together and uh, managed this crisis in an exemplary uh, way and it's one of the many areas in which we can turn to taiwan for collaboration and mutual learning Excellent answer. Um, I, I, I'm just going to point out that Antonio's husband is John Fitzgerald, for those of you wanting to look that article up. Um, yes, so disaster management, and we could talk about um, COVID and things like that as well, um, certainly. But Lenin, Lenin, what, uh, do you have anything you'd like to add? Well, to coming, coming from my um, research area and my background, um, I've got a lot of 
opportunities to engage and observe with both government and civil societies from both sides. So we do see there's a lot of things that Australia and Taiwan can learn from each other and Australia can learn from Taiwan. In in the in the article that I uh on the on the uh, Melbourne Asia Review, I point out a significant area that is Australia should look closely watching what is happening to Taiwan in terms of cyber attack and, and disinformation mm -hmm. campaign. How Taiwan build up its cyber capacities and uh, resilience against cyber attacks will be something that Australia government really need to to uh, watch the space. Mm -hmm. The disinformation campaign, as we see quite often here, are another area that Australia government should, I think, can learn from Taiwan. And these two areas, uh, as some of you might know, has been um, uh, uh, been identified by the World Econ uh, Economic Forum as the two significant issues that we need to tackle in the coming few years. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I would like to point out is um, um, while while we're talking about all these uh, collaborations, Australian government really need to think about uh, while building up a, a, a alliance of trusted partners, uh, we might want to think about who will be the one that is trustable, especially when say we're considering about having a new member in 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 the team in the CPTPP team whether we should consider just the uh, the influence of economy economic influence or should we have someone who is more trusted not make making sure that they are not 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 stealing information from from this um this groups and um I also this is small response to Roger's question here how we can promote more closer and more uh uh collaboration while we're uh we see we see that um there there are a lot of uh organizations that's being set up and of course uh john plays a very important role behind all this um um, um mutual support and understanding here i i think um for example we uh, we, we set up the australia Asian taiwan studies association to promote um the culture and uh taiwan studies in australia to let australia know more about taiwan and what what Taiwan can, uh, are doing in 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 different space. There are also organizations such as Australian Taiwan Business Council that helps build up links between Taiwan and Australia. And we also have the Taiwan uh, Australia Taiwan Club, which try to build links and ties between Australia and Taiwanese politicians. So there are a lot of things we really can do, and not only Australia learn from Taiwan, but how Australia and Taiwan can work together to build up regional security and uh, resilience. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Lenin. So um, just for those of you who can't see the question and answer, Lenin was responding to Roger Huang's question. How can we promote closer and more genuine people to people relationships between Taiwan and Australia? Okay, the next question here, um, Antonia, you probably want to answer this one. In light of Penny Wong's statement yesterday, hinting that Australia may recognize Palestine's statement, how likely do you think the Australian government will announce a similar stance on Taiwan? Right, so Penny Wong's statement on this has come at a time of extreme crisis in uh, Israel-Palestine relations, as we know. I think that the Australian government might announce a similar stance on Taiwan if the People's Republic of China attacked Taiwan. That is, they might do so, especially if the US did so. And uh, someone, just trying to think who it was, has has just, oh, um, is it Matt Pottinger? Has just written um, a policy piece on exactly this, saying that there's no point in formally recognising Taiwan as a state while we are able to keep uh, war at bay while we we're able to juggle this difficult relationship but it's one of the things that the US could do or could hold over China's head to say if you attack Taiwan we will recognize it uh, and uh, un under those circumstances I think Australia would probably follow suit. Uh, yeah good point so the um, the threat of war could um could lead to something like that if, if the PRC ever did invade. There are many reasons for the PRC not to 
do something violent. So maybe cyber war makes more sense for the PRC government at this time. Um, so uh, for those of you in the audience, please keep the questions coming. Please uh, put them into the Q&A button at the bottom there. Um, now, Lenin, you had, um, we, we, we were talking about the, uh, what kind of things Taiwan could offer Australia in relation to cyber crime. Um, and you wanted to say something about indigenous peoples. Yeah, I think, um, one of the key things, uh, one of the linkage I see, uh, that is, uh, linking Australia and Taiwan closely together is the uh, our attitude towards um uh in the uh, uh indigenous and first nation people so mm -hmm. in taiwan we know there's there's a huge uh, a, a a significant group of uh, a significant amount of uh, indigenous people in taiwan which um have done quite a lot of uh, collaborations with uh, uh, our indigenous and first nation people here in australia but what i want to mention here is while we're we're talking about um disinformation one of the key one of the important things is we see how disinformation has been disseminated in us uh, within the diaspora group as well as the indigenous groups and uh, recently i got got a chance to talk to some academic in taiwan and they really see how uh indigenous people become uh, the victim it might not be a correct word but uh the being uh influenced by uh disinformation and and create the the uh uh an uh the in trust with the the Taiwanese government and of course I, I believe Taiwanese government has been doing quite a bit on uh education raising awareness as well as um some church group are doing some programs on that as well that might be something that um, Australian government can can think about and collaborate with Taiwanese um uh, government as well as civil uh, society in promoting our uh, this, uh, knowledge of disinformation, which we see it happen during uh, the time when we had the referendum of the voice, and we probably see it again very soon in our upcoming election. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks very much. Good point. Um, so on indigenous ties uh, as well, um, you know, I, uh, last year when I was in Taiwan, I, uh, I was lucky to go with Marcia Langton, who's an important indigenous leader here in Australia. And uh, she was very well received by indigenous groups across Taiwan. And I was surprised when she said, oh, yeah, I've, I've been to Taiwan before. The first time I came to Taiwan was the 1970s. Um, and there have been a lot of people coming, going back and forth between Taiwan and Australia for these indigenous connections. I, should, I don't want to overemphasize this. There have been some, and we were lucky to have a Kaiwan Pakaiwan come and give the NARM, NARM lecture at late last year in Melbourne. Um, I'm sorry, I just really mispronounced her Paiwan name. I, I'm not going to try it again. Lin Qingmei, and in, as she's better known in Taiwan, uh, visited us here in the University of Melbourne, and we were also fortunate enough to get an interview with her uh, which we did bilingually, and that's also in the, the latest edition of Melbourne Age of Review. Okay, um, one more question uh, in the Q&A. Oh, sorry, Antonia, did you want to say something first? I just wanted to pick up on the issue of Indigenous uh, indigenous issues, uh, First First Nation people's places, uh, putting my historian's hat on, because I think this has been very interesting development in Taiwan as they have written a new history for uh, themselves, for the emerging uh, independent uh, nation state. And it is one that uh, grounds itself in the long history. And it's a parallel that we can see uh, in Australia. You know, this is work in progress on both sides. But I was really interested in uh, Taiwan to pick up a book that I suppose if I were a Taiwan studies person, I would have read long ago. But um, uh, 1997, I think it was the sort of first new history of Taiwan by a Yale graduate called Zhou Wanyao. I don't know if you know this um, book, Lennon, but um, it's in reading that book, you can see her actually doing the creative work of building a history 
for the nation beginning with the Indigenous uh, people. And I just think it has put um, people, Indigenous people in Taiwan in a very interesting position in the political space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're right, despite um, obvious inequality in Taiwan and in Australia um, and ongoing social issues, indigeneity is crucial to any idea of nationhood in both, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Um, look, we've got one more question here um, from Kathy Harper. What are the main reasons the PRC would choose not to launch a conventional war on Taiwan? Interested in the panel's thoughts. Um, why would the PRC not launch a conventional war on Taiwan? Lennon, do you want to start that? There's, there's lots of reasons. <laughs> well, I, I, I would like to reframe it to why would PRC want to launch a conventional crime in Taiwan? And that might be an easier question to answer, but what won't they will sort of suppose that they will. But I don't think um, based on current situation, they will under the pressure from other countries. And or usually, I, 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 my, my personal idea is that they might not do it un, until it's necessary. It's definitely no benefit for them at this stage. And the only benefit for China to take over Taiwan is that they want to, they want to fulfill uh, someone's um, 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 dream to, to, to have Taiwan back to China during, during the term. But um, what what I will say is um, I don't think it. I my personally personally I don't think it's going to happen any soon. And I I what well, when when Antonio was talking about um uh the situation, people think the situation in Taiwan is becoming more and more dangerous. I I usually say we have been in in this situation for more than forty years. Mm. Now you know my age. <laughs> so so um I'm not saying it's impossible, but very unlikely will it happen unless there are very significant events that trigger it to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, Antonia, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, one of the um problems here or a key variable really is Xi Jinping and what he wants his legacy to be. So you know you do have mad men who will make wars whether or not it's likely that the outcome will be very good uh, but i was uh thinking uh recently about the the problem of the one one of the problems of the one child policy uh now is that the army the armed forces are full of these singletons, you know, these children who don't have any brothers and sisters and who are their parents' only children. So you would have a bit of a problem if you start sending all these only children off to war and leaving their parents high and dry. So, yeah, popularity, likely popularity of such a war uh, is a bit of a question, I think. Yeah, yeah the, the, it, it, in, in some ways, uh, it might seem like a war would be popular, but the loss of life would never be popular. And uh, even putting aside the horrible loss of life that would be involved in war, there's the economic issues. And uh, you mentioned legacy, Xi Jinping's legacy. Uh, there is the danger of a very negative legacy, a, a, a war could be a, a, a very negative turning point for China and for East Asia. So yeah, I, I, I think we're all in agreement that a war, well, uh, uh, now, now- a uh, Conventional uh, war. Yes, yes, seeing Lenin's article, a conventional war seems uh, very, very unlikely, uh, especially in the short term. Hmm. Antonio disagrees. Well, I just would say that I'm complete agnostic on that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Great. Uh, well, thanks very much. Look, it's four o'clock, so I think 
we have to wrap things up now. So uh, I'd like to thank especially Lenin and Antonia for being a wonderful, um, uh, wonderful panelists and uh, having a great conversation. And also like to thank uh, Annalise for organizing and Kathy Harper and the Melbourne Asia Review for making all of this possible. So um, thanks everybody. And please do have a look at the uh, edition. It's uh, you, uh, it's quite easy to find, Melbourne Asia, Asia, Melbourne Asia Review. We're on the front page. And also, uh, if you're interested in Taiwan, you're interested in culture, you're interested in indigenous issues, we do have the Taiwan Film Festival coming up again. We do an annual festival, annual film festival. Uh, Lennon and I are both involved in it. Lennon, what are the dates? Is it June first? Yeah, and it, the the uh, Ta uh, Melbourne Town Film Festival will be on thirtieth of May to first of June, and we have lined up four uh, very good movies. So stay tuned. Get tickets early because. Um, they're free, so they <laughs> they won't last. But please join us in uh, at the end of May to, uh, to to attend the Taiwan Film Festival. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks a lot, Craig. Thank you. Bye. Bye.